well, by the time I was nine or ten, I was uh, a uh, earnest practitioner of ceremonial magic. And I would draw pentacles in my room and burn and rosemary. And uh, I was also an altar boy at this time. <laughs> and uh, it made some problems. Uh, I recall one time, I don't know how many of you are... Uh, are recovering Catholics, but uh, there's a thing which they bring out once a year. I don't know if they still do this. They've sort of left the faith, but uh, they have this thing which they use at Midnight Mass and Easter called an aspergillium, and it looks like a baby's rattle, and you put it in water, and it has holes in the round head, and it fills with holy water, and then you can fling holy water great distances uh, with this thing. And uh, so one day back in the sacristy, we were cleaning out some things, and there, he came up, the priest came upon this old aspergillium. And I said, whoa, he was about to get rid of it. And I said, whoa, I, I have a use for that. And he said, oh, what, what is your use for this, my son? And I said, well, I'm involved in the conjuration of uh, Azael, the 11th general of the Mercuric Sphere. And it, uh, it uh, launched an investigation that has made that town unsafe for the practice of ceremonial magic to this day. Uh, but... The, the point of my story is they needn't have worried because, and I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but look, I'm paid to be controversial, you understand? <laughs> so uh, uh, they needn't have worried because at least for this lumpen Irishman, uh, it didn't work. No matter how much rosemary I burned, no matter how many wax sigils were formed, no matter how many uh, even more peculiar things were undertaken, uh, it didn't seem to cut the mustard. And uh, then around the time that I was 14 or so, I, I had many obsessions. I mean, my life seems ruled by obsession. And at some point I became aware that there was a book at the library that they didn't want me to read. This was when I was somewhat younger. And they didn't want me to read this book. And the librarian who was friends with my mother had been told if he asks for this book, don't let him have it. So I not only determined to read the book, I determined to read every book the author had ever written. And uh, the book... Uh, was Brave New World, which I don't know how many of you have read it. It wouldn't stir a small wind these days, but it did involve all the women did wear these prophylactic, some kind of, I never quite understood what it was, but it was some kind of birth control kit that they wore on the belt. And of course, uh, people were grown in vats and had very free sex and so forth and so on. It was an interesting book, but then I started reading the author, Aldous Huxley. And I read Chrome Yellow, and I read Antic Hay, and I read After Many a Summer Dies the Swan, and I read Ape and Essence. And some of these things were like screenplays, and some were comedies of British manners. I kept hoping we'd get back to the prophylactic belt thing. Um, <laughs> And instead, eventually, I came upon uh, The Doors of Perception and read this book. And it was like, I, it had never entered my mind, the concept of uh, drugs, intoxication, information from reflection of that sort. I mean, the whole thing was just uh, completely puzzling to me. And I can remember following my mother around the kitchen of our suburban home saying, if one-tenth of what this guy is saying is true, this is the most amazing thing in the world. Well, now we know that that's a very mild book, very limited in its claims. I mean, he talks about staring at the folds of his trousers and thinking about Hildegard von Bingen and uh, 
uh, it's basically presented as a thought thing, and most of you look like you're probably not old enough to remember, but there was a point in the evolution of awareness about the psychedelic experience where the way people did it is they piled up art books, favorite recordings, foods, perfumes, and then they would get loaded, and then they would look at the art books, eat the orange, smell the perfume. It, it's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but uh, that that was the clue to me that there was something going on. And I, as I say, I was about fourteen, and I had a lot ahead of me before I really took my first trip. Um, and I was trying to figure it out, shopping in the, in the supermarket of ideas of the time, reading Camus, reading Nietzsche, reading Sartre, and all these people are a huge downer, as any of you <laughs> know who've read them. I mean, the entire tone of modernity is just one big downer after another you know if it's not Hannah Arendt on the triviality of evil well then it's Carl Jaspers on something else or Sartre and it just horrible horrible stuff well so I, I, I became aware through Huxley that there was this other possibility and, and, I, and Huxley always wrote about the psychedelic experience as a branch of the mystical quest what he called the perennial philosophy and so I started reading uh, both the scholars of mysticism, such as Evelyn Underhill and um, uh, William James, varieties of the religious experience, and so forth and so on. And I started reading the primary sources, Teresa of Avila, Thomas Traherne, Jakob Burma, what's the singing nut, Hildegard von Bingen, <laughs> all of these people and and I got the idea that there was this experience but I couldn't find it I couldn't find it in uh, you know on my knees at the church for hour after hour I mean I found various forms of existential boredom ad infinitum <laughs> but actual and I would sit in nature, and I would hyperventilate, and I would uh, do all these things. Well, the juice just wasn't coming. Well, to make a long story short, eventually, like lots and lots of people, and by my own personal route, uh, I found my way to these things. And they are, to my mind, uh, astonishing worthy of taking risks for because uh, they work I think to some degree it's true that all culture is somewhat unfriendly to the individual I you know when they when their heavy arm falls on your shoulder and they tell you that you're going to be sent off to some foreign hellhole to kill people as a young man, you definitely suddenly get the notion that culture is not your friend. Uh, but perhaps, you know, if you're a 12-year-old boy in an Amazonian tribe and they announce that now it's time for the two-week abandonment in the woods, from which if you live to tell the tale, you'll become a full member of society. I'm not sure those kids greet that with a leap of joy in their hearts. It's like, oh my God, now this. We knew it was coming. Uh, I went through rites of passage like that that were excruciating. Where I grew up in... Western Colorado, you weren't a real man unless sometime between 12 and 16 you uh, killed an elk. Uh, hunting season every October was an excuse for this insane rite of passage. And my father was an unquestioning inhabitant of his culture. And so this was always in front of me. And when I was... Uh, 
I guess when I was 12, I went the first time. I didn't get anything. The second year, we went out, and uh, and uh, you know, my father, I'm sure, had no idea what a what a wilted pansy I was <laughs> in this situation because I had hid it from him. I mean, I, I was concerned about all kinds of things, and and. Eventually, this situation arose where they put me up on this point and gave me a gun and said, "If anything came by, to blow it away." And uh, you know, by God, this thing, you know, chose to sacrifice itself. As far as I could tell, I mean, it did not behave at all like elk behave. It basically just came out of the woods, stood still, I. Pulled down on it, closed my eyes, prayed. There was an enormous noise. When I opened my eyes, there was nothing whatsoever to be seen. I felt an enormous relief that this thing had escaped, and walked over to find it dead as a doornail. And uh, you know, the oak leaves dipped in the blood. The cup of blood, the whole thing. I mean, I couldn't believe how atavistic this stuff was. However, I never had to please my father again. I was home free. Everything was forgiven from that moment on. But it brought home to me how uncomfortable culture is, and to, and always has been. I think. Okay, well, uh, I suppose I should make a sort of introduction of my myself. Um, I was born uh, a few months after the atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. I was born in November of '46. I'm a double Scorpio, and uh, born in Western Colorado. Uh, and lived there till I was 16. Came to California, finished high school here, went to Cal, was around Berkeley for eight or nine years when I wasn't in Asia, and I was in Asia a lot. First in the Seychelles, where I tried to immigrate, emigrate. Uh, then in India, uh, mostly smuggling hash and buying art. And then when that became untenable, I went to Indonesia and collected butterflies for Singapore Chinese for a while, and then taught English in Japan, and、uh, and then went to the Amazon in '71. And that trip to the Amazon is the subject of a book I wrote called、uh, True Hallucinations. Uh, recently, for some reason, I had to、uh, lay out my income for an attorney and say how much I spent every month on things like entertainment and so forth and so on. So he called me on the phone. He said,、uh, "You declared fifteen、uh, dollars a month for entertainment." He said. Based on your income, do you know how much would be a standard deduction for entertainment? And I said, "How much?" He said, "Seven hundred dollars a month." I said, "That's inconceivable to me. What kind of idiot would I be if I?" And I said, "And I put down the fifteen dollars because I knew you wanted something, but in fact, I don't think I spend fifteen dollars a month on entertainment. What is entertainment anyway?" Uh, so、um, you know, I, I, I suppose it just sounds like preaching a kind of monkishness. But what is the charm of all this crap? Can anybody explain it to me? I heard a story about the Dalai Lama.、Uh, th- I mean, let this ricochet around in your mind. The Dalai Lama came to Los Angeles, and so the committee that was there to receive him and make his visit comfortable wanted to 
do something with him in L.A. that would be uniquely L.A., but that would uh, be amusing for Dolly. So they decided to take him to Rodeo Drive. <laughs> and uh, and uh, basically, they just turned him loose with his translator and said, you know, we'll meet you back here in an hour and a half and uh, check it out. This is a unique place in American culture. So then after it was over and they were all having their double espresso or the Campari or whatever they were having, uh, the Dalai Lama said, I want to thank you so much for making this experience available to me. I feel I understand Americans so much better now. I saw so many things I wanted. This is the Dalai Lama talking. He saw so many things he wanted. Well, if the Dalai Lama is not immune, my God, what chance have you and I? Uh, if the Dalai Lama can't hold this stuff back, you know, you might as well buy that Hermes scarf. Just give up. Give them the $200 for the damn thing and enjoy it. Uh, Carl Sagan visited me once in Hawaii, but he was more concerned to figure out whether I really was talking to extraterrestrials on mushrooms. To his credit, he was willing to come and have a discussion about that. And also, you know, I have the certitude of megalomania. So you don't, you, you don't need Carl Sagan to tell you you're right when you have megalomania. Uh, you just confidently sit back and wait for it all to blow your way. And, you know, it's worked for me over and over in my life. Uh, it was interesting, a few weeks ago, I was visited uh, in Hawaii by none other than Carl Sagan. And uh, he had a number of things on his mind, but uh, one, one of the things that he was at great pains to point out to me was I said something about this asymptotic approach to the end of history. And he said, well, my dear boy, uh, you just have it all wrong. Uh, the speed of information transfer reached the speed of light with the invention of radio. It's been absolutely flat ever since. The largest thermal nuclear blast ever detonated was in 1958. There hasn't been a bigger one for 30 years. Uh, the fastest human object ever built was launched in 1967. There hasn't been a faster one since. So this nonsense about ever increasing this, that, and the other is just doesn't hold water. The genius behind Banana Republic wanted to have a travel magazine, and he decided that, that he would call the travel magazine Trips. <laughs> I, I have to smile. <laughs> and he, he further decided that uh, he would uh, have a monthly column, which he wanted to call Our Man in Nirvana. <laughs> Believe it or not, I was asked if I would like to be our man in Nirvana. Well, naturally, I said I had to think it over and uh, discuss it. Uh, but I was, uh, it was like a dream come true. Can you imagine a situation where all expenses paid, you rode the world looking for the most beautiful places, and when they publish, you get a dollar a word, and when they don't publish what you write, you get 25 cents a word, which is more than most magazines pay when they publish you. So uh, I went to Southern Thailand on this assignment. That, by the way, since uh, this happened, the magazine has gone defunct to have one issue. <laughs> it's, it's not the first time that I have stowed away aboard the sinking ship. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
But to, to the botanical point of the story, which shows you the kinds of adventures and courage and dedication that botanical dimensions brings to bear on its task, uh, I was in Thailand, naturally, and you access Thailand through Bangkok. And I had read in Richard Evans Schulte's book, The Botany and Chemistry of Hallucinogens, about a plant called Kraton. Kraton. And uh, it said it was illegal in Thailand. Well, friends, Thailand is the source of one-third of the world's heroin. It is uh, the destination of most of the sex tours that originate in Frankfurt and Dusseldorf and places like that. In other words, they run a pretty loose scene in <laughs> and, and here, this plant is illegal. And I thought, well, this is pretty amazing. Uh, what's going on? So uh, I was staying with an art dealer friend, and he had this Thai wife. So I put the problem to her. And she said, yes, oh, yes, the, the, the most degenerate people know all about this. <laughs> and knowing my friend, I said, well, then you must have several friends. <laughs> 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 I'll put us in touch with this. And uh, and so we put out the word, and uh, lo and behold, uh, we got samples of this plant, rootstock. Uh, and there was, it was very hush-hush, and everyone was either giggling or, or looking at us with thin, hard expressions as we uh, scored this plant. And we now have it. It is now growing in Hawaii. It is available for uh, certified biochemists and biochemical researchers to determine what this thing is. What we learned as we made our way toward it was why it's illegal. It's illegal because it inhibits and interferes with heroin addiction. <laughs> so, who knows, you know, if this is true. But say it were true. Well, that means, you know, this is ethnobotanically one of the great coups of the decade. And it explains then why the Thais are of such a uh, ambivalent state of mind about it because it's poised like a dagger at the heart of their economic life uh, if it's real. I had a very weird, in fact, you know, one of the high water weirdness events of my life was when I was young, I used to, uh, I was, I wanted the DMT flash to last longer. So I used to smoke it uh, at the height of LSD trips. And one uh, Christmas vacation, this rooming house that I managed in Berkeley had been, everybody had gone home for Christmas, I thought. And so I decided I would take some LSD and smoke DMT. And, um, and so I took the LSD and then I smoked the DMT. It was just nuts. I mean, it's nuts enough. But this was like turbocharged nuts. It went on and on and on. And finally, I, uh, there was a woman who I rented a room to upstairs uh, named uh, Rosemary, who was supposed to be in Minnesota. And she was a... Um, actress and very projective and did everything with great flair and she apparently came back early from Christmas vacation so she hit the front steps running of this house and and used her key to let herself into the front door and came right around to my door and started beating on my door well I am by nature a very paranoid person. I mean, I can be up the Rio Yaguas Yasu in the middle of the Amazon basin and if I'm out in the rainforest smoking a joint and a stick is broken anywhere near me, I immediately hide the dope. You know, I'm very paranoid. So this woman lets herself in and comes and beats with her clenched fist on, on my bedroom door. Well, I like underwent a, a coronary thrombosis or something. And
And I was in the elf space, and they were screeching and chattering and showing me all this stuff. And when she <laughs> did this, I like I I flew off the bed. I jumped like I put two feet in the air and and landed on my feet. And it was it was as though and don't try this at home, folks. It it, it was as though the uh, this sudden. Flash of adrenaline and this sudden movement that I made broke up the ordinary division between the trip and norm normality or something. Anyway, I pulled the trip with me into the room. I was now standing in the room, eyes open, but the the elf creatures had come with me. And everything had just been like jacked up to some immense level of intensity, and there were these rotating geometric things in the room uh, hanging in the air, and it was like moving in this jerky motion. This thing was going click, click. Click, and it was faceted. And every time it would make this large metallic click, these plastic triangle-shaped, brightly colored chips or something like little pieces of a floor tile or something would fly across the room. And each one of them had a letter on it in an alien language, sort of like Hebrew or Sanskrit. And it was just there were several of these machines and. The These things were ricocheting off the walls, and I had an elf hanging off each hand, and I was turning her, and I was just saying, "Holy shit!" You know, I pull, I, I'm, 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 uh, and I, and then she's still beating on the door, you know. So I stagger over to the door, fling it back, and look at her and say something like, "Wait, Dukwam, Wapsi, who, Wani, Mum, Hapti, Kuputi, Shning." And then she realized at that point what my problem was and uh, and retreated. But I, I've never forgotten. It's the one time that it, that they went literary on me, and not only did I see them, not only did I hear them, but I they were printing on the air the message as well. Very curious. When I was schizophrenic, if this is what we're talking about, my feeling about it was, and maybe this is, if not true, a delusion worth playing with, is I thought, aha, what we call mental illness, what we call schizophrenia, <laughs> and what we look into the body or the mind or the personal history or the dream state to try and understand and. Possibly cure, it's not like that at all. It isn't your pr if you're the person who's nuts. It isn't your problem. It's something that's happened to you. Not more fundamentally than catching the flu. It's like you just happened to step in some cosmic doo doo. And now it's on the bottom of your shoe, and everybody's pointing at you and backing up. But it isn't your fault. It was just happened to be in your path. It's a kind of um, it's a horrible piece of luck, unless you can turn it to your own uh, to your own advantage. And what that means, I think, is. Obviously, integrating it. Well, then, how do you integrate these things? Uh, um, I think it has to do again a lot with where you start from. Just speaking from my own personal experience, what saved me was my cynicism uh, that I didn't believe in anything, never had, had always thought believing in things was a bad idea. So then, when this 
whole cosmos of beliefs was handed to me on a platter, I just simply said, maybe, you know, I'll act it out, but I won't, I won't believe it. And I think that had I been a good Mormon, a good Catholic, a good Buddhist, a good something else, then I would have been lost because I would have traded whatever it was I believed for the new set of beliefs. As it was, I just said, you know, what's this? Beliefs. I don't do that. But I played with it. And somehow the playing with it was able to depotentiate it. Uh, I had a conversation with someone very recently who, by ordinary standards, I think, would have to be considered nutty as a fruitcake. And, uh, you know, they could hardly speak of their condition without being swept by an emotion that was so intense that it reduced them to tears, you know. And I said, you know, if you're going to be this nuts, you should enjoy it more, you know. It's too... And they said, you know, I am enjoying it. And I said, well, I'm not enjoying it because you're just projecting such an emotional intensity that it makes me very nervous and I think I'm generally I speak then for the same general masses about that what makes it hard for the person who's going through this is that it's so hard for other people I mean it's freaky to be around somebody who's crazy I don't, you know, because I'm such a purveyor of psychedelics, people are forever leaning on me to trip with them. And I dare say, you know, there are people in this room who've known me for years, and no one here can say they've ever been seriously loaded with me. Because I just don't do it. I can't take it. I can't handle... um, the feeling, the feeling of risk that permeates that. That's why it amazes me. I, I'm fascinated by people who have such faith in their knowledge that, that apparent difficult situations don't freak them out. As an example, some of you know Frank Barr. He's an emergency room doctor. And I'm amazed that he can deal with people who are dead out unconscious and just say, she'll come to in 40 minutes or so. Don't worry about that. When I would be frantic. I mean, if I can't get a reaction out of somebody, I just go berserk. And uh, uh, the notion, I don't know whether that's a kind of callousness. Therapists are like that. I mean, they say, you know, you come up on somebody flopping around on the floor, screaming, pleading, weeping. My inclination is to make them feel better, for God's sake. And a therapist would just say, well, they're working through their stuff. (laughs) It's all right, you know. Uh, How do you get that level of self-confidence where you can see somebody in agony and say, that's all right, it's the best thing for them. Check on them in an hour and uh, see where they're at. It's awfully... uh, So I stay away from it. And in my own situation, I keep people away from me. I've had many trips where I've thought in the middle of it, thank God there's no one here to see this. Because if there were someone here to see it, I'm sure they would become alarmed and decide that some crisis was in progress. And, you know, ultimately, you have to sort of get a kind of perspective where you just say, if I die, I die. Uh, But it usually has to slam you to the wall pretty severely to make you turn. The image I have is that I run from it until I become so furious at this humiliating situation that I turn and face it. And then, you know, if you curse it, it will step back sometimes. And it's worked every time. The other thing is, you know, the wonderful (coughs) 
instinct for equilibrium that the human mind has uh, that you can get pretty twisted around. And if you'll wait 24 hours, 72 hours, 10 days, 6 months, it will restore to equilibrium. I'm puzzled by the cases of permanent raving madness and I wonder how common they are. It's all messed up in this society. I mean, I can show you psychiatric residents who have never seen an unmedicated schizophrenic in their entire life, you know, because you just they just do not encounter people in that state. What they deal with are people who come in and been given drugs and kept on drugs and drugs, drugs, drugs. That's the whole, uh, the whole dynamic. This belief that the world is entirely independent of our minds and objective and unaware of us is the kind of science, uh, scientific fiction in which we operate. And then the real truth that appears to our perceptions, the truth of our immediate experience, is that the, the mind is a concentric field of diminishing intensity that can draw events and circumstances far from the ranges of probability. Uh, I mean, I had, once I had the following experience, it's all anecdotal, you see. I was in a dry wash in the Negev desert, uh, and there was absolutely no food, and I was a uh, poor traveling, hippie, a hashashin, and a cave dweller, and a ne'er-do-well, and it was like 120 degrees outside my cave, and I was sitting in front of my cave, um, smoking hash, and out through the shimmering heat, I could see this dot of a person, and as I watched them making their way through the rocks and the scrub, uh, I began to have a fantasy about this person, that they had food, that they didn't simply have food, that, that they had oysters Rockefeller packed in ice, that they had Russian caviar, that they had Belgian chocolate, that they had all of this stuff and you know I hadn't had a bath in three weeks there was barely any water in this place and this speck made its way toward me getting larger and larger and finally it turned into this guy I barely knew a fellow lost soul this was in southern Israel 25 years ago and he said and he came up to me and he said I have oysters packed in ice. I have Belgian chocolate. I have... And he had uh, gotten a job dishwashing that morning at the King David Hotel and had just quit in disgust halfway through the day and had raided this super fancy four-star hotel and just had a backpack full of this stuff and I didn't even bother to tell him I mean, what am I gonna say you know I mean sure of course <laughs> so these kinds of things uh, and they're very private you see nothing happens there except that a guy quits his job and rips off a uh, hotel, except that it is coincident with an internal state, a private musing of somebody else, and when the two things come together, the coincidence of it is absolutely excruciating.
Oh, I was in London a few weeks ago and at a party, and I was the guest of honor, and they brought out last year's Welch mushrooms and made a big tea for everybody, and the hostess said, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just almost like a gesture. I mean, there are so many of us and so few mushrooms, but we'll each just get a little bit. Well, so I was first out of the shoot, and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, I don't know whether it all pooled on the top in one place or what was going on, but... You know, I just sat down on the ground and this guy who said, some person of great reputation who said he'd wanted to meet me for years and years was sitting in front of me trying to get to know me. And and finally he just said, he said, you're flaming, aren't you? And I said, yes, I can't carry on this conversation. I just have to hold on to the grass. Well, I don't know. Uh what all this means. I don't want to become afraid of it, and I blame myself. I don't think the thing has a negative edge unless you've somehow come out of jiggle with it. And I don't know whether that means, you know, what does it mean if it becomes harder and harder to take these things? Does it mean you're getting out of balance? Does it mean you're just getting older? Where should the blame be put and then what can you do about it the only thing I found to do about it is stop running and turn and face it but each time I do that it seems to require the very limit of my courage and I don't know how long one's courage lasts Uh, maybe it's not a bad thing I mean after all people who climb mountains like Mount Everest they don't do it till their dying day at some point, they, you know, knock off and become a consultant for a sportswear manufacturer or something. He, he at times, appeared to work miracles. At one point, I, I was trying to test him and his abilities and I recalled that there was a a box that my grandfather had given me that you opened with a little silver key that had been lost for years and years and he I said well if you can do anything why don't you produce the key that uh, to that box which neither of us had seen even the box for a dozen years by this time, he was naked and locked in a room at the mission. And, uh, and, he went, and he would make these bizarre gestures, these strange, arch- I don't know what was going on. And he, uh, he went into a period of concentration, gave a wild squawk, and slammed into my hand and gave me the key. Gave me the key. He was naked. He had been locked in this room for 14 days at that time. And I was like, I didn't know what was going on. But (laughs) what was happening to me was, I was like utterly unconcerned for his mental health or any practical concern, which was causing a lot of problems for the other people on the expedition. In classical psychology, this is called a a, a folle a deux, a delusion of two. It's a simultaneous schizophrenic episode. It usually (laughs) involves a mother and a daughter. I've never heard of a brother-brother folle a deux. But it was accompanied by all these exterior manifestations, freak rainbows, and uh, in my case, an encounter with a UFO. And this UFO encounter had a very curious quality to it. Not that they don't always, I suppose. But this was even more curious than the pedestrian UFO encounter. What happened was... uh, It was on the the 13th day of the reversal. And... uh, that I had had this intimation there was something going on about the southwest I wasn't clear quite what it was and the the two women on the expedition were that afternoon 
washing our clothes down by the choro, by the lake, and I looked across the lake and I saw in the sky not a rainbow, but just a spot in the sky that was a spectrogrammatic diffraction, you know, a little patch of rainbow. And I asked the women if they saw it, and they said they didn't. And then it intensified. And by this time, I was plenty in the doghouse as well. I mean, this put a great deal of strain on our small party, as you can imagine. And uh, this spectrogrammatic iridule intensified. And then I said to them, now do you see it? And they looked and they said, oh, yeah, mm, it's, you know, big deal, not much. But I knew, I knew, and knowing means the voice was speaking to me. All kinds of weird things went on. I mean, uh, I discovered that I, that the closer I was to water, the easier it was for me to rhyme, mm. at which I've never... And then years later, I encountered a Celtic saying, poetry is made at the edge of running water. Mm. And, uh, and the thing would give me these aphorisms. Like one time it said, the clone's load is a stoned mode. And, you know, and I was not sleeping. I was now 11 days without sleep. So uh, that night I decided to sit by the choro and just, because I stayed up all night and I would walk in the fields and the thing would draw the would connect up the constellations for me and show me where they were in the sky. There was also embedded in all this thing the intimation of this thing called the teacher, which was a giant insect-like thing that was always like right over here. And there was the sense of something watching us from the sky, something moving us very, very gently but persistently toward this very weird breakthrough. One of the hardest evenings I ever spent was that combination. And I will never do that again. But I haven't been able to line up too much support. The question is, what about combining uh, Pagamon harmala with mushrooms, with Stropheric cubensis? Now, what happened to me was I took uh, uh, half a dose of mushrooms, which for me would be two and a half grams. I took two and a half grams of mushrooms with half a dose of ayahuasca. And it was, uh, it was um, mm, seemed crazy-making to me. Very, very, very unpleasant state I was I think what was happening as I analyzed it later was that short-term memory absolutely would not transcript and so I got into this strange loop which went like this something's wrong what's wrong nothing's wrong okay something's wrong <laughs> What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Okay. And it and it was it was serious and it went on for about an hour and I I just did not know what to do. I I had the image from 2001 of the guy outside the ship saying open the pod doors, Hal. Saying I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> open the pod doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. And I, it, it, it really seemed to me I could almost see an enzymatic, I almost had like a nano-engineer's view of the problem. I could see at the synaptic level that the molecular machinery was lodged in some peculiar configuration. And, and, I, just, and I just, I was broke into a sweat and I, and I just said, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sit here till this goes away. I'm not going to start screaming. I'm not going to call for help. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait until this 
goes away. And then I started deep breathing as a strategy for metabolizing. And after 45 minutes or so, it kind of jiggled loose. And then it was like, oh, huh. oh, wow, what a bummer that was. were in the Amazon in 76 taking ayahuasca. We got in with this certain group of people in Peru that took it every week. And, you know, cultures have different ways of handling hassle. And in some cultures it's confrontational, in other cultures not. The way these Peruvian country folk operated was if somebody was screwing up, nobody would ever say so they would just talk about these people behind their back until the morphogenetic field of gossip was so strong that you would basically awaken to the problem. So there was a complex social situation going on in this ayahuasca circle, which was there was a master shaman who we were apprenticed to, who was beloved by his neighborhood. But he had a, 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 a nephew, a sobrino, who was a jerk. I mean, this guy was, uh, as Don Fidel said, ambitious. He dealt a little weed, he did a little pimping, he was just sort of an edge runner type of guy. And every Saturday night, we would all get together and take ayahuasca, about 30 of us. Older shamans, our guy, people from the neighborhood, and this sobrino, Don Jose. So, uh, I don't know what the real history of it was, because I had just arrived on the scene, but these old guys would sing these Icaros, these magical songs on ayahuasca that appear as colored tapestries in front of your eyes. And you know, they were, they had soul, they were into it, they were, and this guy would sing against them. I mean, it's the rudest thing you can possibly imagine. I mean, imagine if, if uh, you know, Lou Reed were trying to give a performance and the guy in the third row just launched into Old Man River <laughs> and kept at it, you know? I mean, in this town, I'm sure large guys would appear and say, Sir? <laughs> in Peru, it didn't work like that. They just kept singing. He kept singing. And it was clear that this is how it was going to be handled, that we had just divided into two separate entities here. Well, um, my uh, wife was sitting next to me, and he was sitting across the room from us, the Sabrino. And I had been watching him for a long time, and I was loaded to the gills. And I could see he would get up on his haunches, and he, he looked like a monkey. He, he, his face. It was uncanny. I mean, he looked like a monkey, and he also looked kind of like a jackal, a dog with long teeth. He kept going through these changes, and and Kat leaned over to me and said something like, this guy is an asshole. And I just said, you know, let it slide. What do we know? Think of it as anthropology. <laughs> but she, she wasn't having it. So after a while, uh, he kept doing this, and at one point, and everybody in the room, every person in the room was bummed out, and they were looking at their laps. All eye contact was broken. It's actually, when I was a kid, I invented a word. The word is fardow, and it means the embarrassment you feel when someone else fucks up. 
you know, and you happen to just be there, but somehow the aura of it is so strong. So the entire room is just awash in Fardo, and the old guys are singing, and the guy is singing. So then at the end of a particularly intense clash of these two styles, uh, my wife just looked across the room at this guy and, like, put the whammy on him. And I saw these red arrows leave her eyes and like like dotted lines go across them and they move fairly slowly you know more slowly than you could throw a ball or something well when this line of red arrows got to this guy he was knocked off his feet he, he fell backwards with his legs in the air and there was a big noise and all the singing stopped and everybody in the room looked up and these three old shaman who were sitting behind Don Fidel who I to that point had not heard speak any language but Quechua one turned to the other and he says in Spanish oh the gringa sends the Zabudaba <laughs> I had an experience earlier this summer, which I probably shouldn't tell, but I will, <laughs> that is an example of how it gets weird. We, ha we uh, a friend of mine moved to London and left me his library for unspecified amounts of time to keep a very bizarre library, mostly platonic stuff, a lot of magic, a lot of uh, that sort of thing. And so we built a book loft for it, and our house is wedge-shaped, and so this book loft is way up at the top of the house. And uh, I was alone in the house, and I took uh, seven dried grams, and I was sitting there, and uh, it was just beginning to come on. I was in the show what you know thing phase, and it was beginning to show what it knew, and there was this disrupted area of space in front of me where it was like rotating, and I was looking into it and talking it up, and I was actually speaking, at first I was just speaking in my mind, then I began speaking aloud, and I was saying, you are a beautiful thing, you are beautiful, and suddenly, there, things changed, and it became very cold, and uh, meaning the temperature fell suddenly. And uh, the dog next door, who never howls, howled. And uh, the cat, which was down below me, I was up in this loft looking down at our bed, the cat was on the bed, the cat flared out and made this really weird noise, and I just, you know, I stopped what I was doing and projected my mind into this situation. And at that moment, I heard this sound, which was like, and then something settled onto the roof, sufficient to make the six by 14 inch beam creak in. Just went, <laughs> And I was floored. <laughs> and I just, I just sat for a minute, and I was not frightened. In fact, my emotion was um, hard to get back to, but I wasn't <laughs> frightened. But just at that moment, these, this thing was really coming on and really visually peculiar, and it seemed like the two things were independent. The trip was getting stronger and stronger, but a ten-ton something had landed on the <laughs> roof beam of my house. So I just sat with it for about 30 seconds, and then this thought or voice came, and it, it was, this thing has come because of something I'm doing. And that means that I can get rid of it. So I just turned like this up toward the roof and projected this thought very strongly, which was, be gone. I am in conversation with an elder. <laughs> and uh, this thing went, Aah! and there was a long pause, 10 seconds or so. And then whatever it was, it lifted off the roof. 
and went away. And what was weird about this was I had never, I had never ever used in my own mind this phrase, an elder, to describe the mushroom. It was like just came out of me. And the whole episode seemed real weird to me. And uh, I just let it ride. But that's an instance where, you know, there is this, let's call it synchronicity, so that we don't have to believe that a pterodactyl landed on my roof. There is this synchronicity. For some reason, there chose to be a fluttering sound and the beam chose to creep. Now, doubtless, this has to do with temperature and the cooling of day to night and this and that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a thing to go through. This is my ending story for the afternoon. I don't present it as a summation, uh, but it amuses me. For those of you who don't like Jewish jokes, you will notice as this joke is told that it is easily translated into a Zen mode, a Sufi mode. Uh, I just like the Jewish flavor. There were two rabbis extremely advanced high rabbis, Talmudists, great men of accomplishment. And they were at temple. And one of them uh, prayed. And he said, Lord, he stood up and he spoke aloud and he said, Lord, I am nothing. And then he sat down and the other guy got up and he said, Lord, I am nothing. And there was a guy there sweeping the floor, a custodial person. And he thought, well, people are praying. I get a prayer in here. So he stood up and said, uh, Lord, I'm nothing. And the first rabbi looked at the second rabbi and he said, so look who thinks he's nothing. <laughs> That's it. That's a story about the imagination. I grew up in western Colorado, and we prided ourselves on being westerners. Every time I come south, I realize that the place where I grew up was south, but like schizoid about it and never owned up to the fact that the psychology of North Carolina is more what Western Colorado is about than the psychology of Southern California by any stretch. Anyway, not to wander, I grew up <laughs> in this place and uh, I was curious. And I think curiosity is the psychedelic virtue. It's the precondition for finding your way into the presence of this answer, intellectual curiosity. And I was told, uh, well, you know, there were dinosaurs here a hundred million years ago, and uh, 50 million years before that, there was an ocean here. And we would go out into the dry arroyos and sandstone country, and here would be these seashells and, and spiral ammonites and stuff. And I was obsessed with the sea because I had never seen it. I didn't see the ocean until I was 14 years old. Uh, and yet here was evidence of the ocean in some of the driest and most shattered desert country you could ever see. And so I, it, I got the message. And the message is, the world is not what it appears to be. Where there are deserts, one finds evidence of oceans. Where there are wastelands, one finds evidence of jungles. Uh, and by extension, where there is love, one can uncover animosity and conflict. Where there is hate, one can uncover love and community. So very early, I got the notion things are not as they appear to be.